Greetings, I'm your Glenn Beck of Current Music, The Long Wannabe, and welcome to a movie moment. Now, I am a huge comic book movie fan. It's a known fact between me and all my friends. In fact, every Friday after my playwriting class, me and a group of my friends go down to the local Pizza Hut and reminisce about our favorite moments from comic book movies and what the future holds for them. Why? Because we have a passion for it. And why not? Superheroes are a cornerstone of the American dream. We look up to them and wish we could be them. They are part of the imagination we love unlocking and distilling ourselves into. Every superhero is unique and has their own flaws. To see these characters grow from the page onto the big screen is an amazing accomplishment. But sometimes, not every film adaptation is perfect. Take one of my favorite superheroes, Spider-Man. Everyone is quick to judge the Spider-Man film series because of what happened to Sam Raimi's trilogy with the grossly unequal Spider-Man 3. Every nerd out there throws all their anger at the film judged solely on nitpicks of what happened to the character of Venom. Who, may I need to remind you, wasn't even supposed to be in the film at all, so let's stop harassing Sam for what the studios made him do. Sam's trilogy is, in my mind, what Spider-Man was supposed to be. It felt like a real comic book. Sure. Spider-Man 1 wasn't perfect, but as a kid first seeing Peter Webb slinging up on the silver screen for the first time, I was blown away. And need we forget that Spider-Man 2 is one of the greatest superhero movies ever made? Yep, I said it. It goes right up in my top 5 next to the original Superman and Iron Man. But this talk is not about Raimi nor his original trilogy. It's all about Mark Webb and his future endeavors with the amazing Spider-Man. Allow me to get this right off my chest. I really despise The Amazing Spider-Man. Now, it wasn't the actor's fault or anything like that. They all did a pretty decent job. It was the characterization and bastardizing of some of the greatest works of Stan Lee. Allow me to go a little deeper into this. I'm Gotham's Reckoning. Ever since Christopher Nolan came out with his Dark Knight trilogy, there's been an underlying need in the comic book world to make everything more gritty and broody. That may have worked for Batman, but it doesn't transfer well to other characters. Take, for example, the new Man of Steel film. The first few trailers had me worried with how dark and grim the movie was going to make Superman look. You have to keep this side of yourself a secret. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. He's a big blue boy scout, for God's sakes. Another example were the trailers for Iron Man 3. The first two Iron Mans were edgy, adrenaline pumping, and kick ass. The trailer for the third one made it look, big shock here, dark and more depressing. I'm gonna offer the choice. Do you want an empty life or a meaningful death? Of course, once you saw the film, you realize it was anything but that, but still. Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy left a mark, which all these corporate bigwigs are trying to capitalize on when in reality, not every superhero needs to be dark. Batman worked because it's freaking Batman! Obviously, Sony thought this would work for Spider-Man as well, because The Amazing Spider-Man was anything but comic booky. Peter Parker was no longer the lovable nerd. He was some skateboarding douche. The death of Peter's parents were transformed into some kind of conspiracy, plus the lizard... They ruined him! Now, there were a few things Mark Webb was able to touch up on, like Spider-Man's quips and web shooters. That was all fine and dandy, but those were small peckings compared to the big picture in which the film missed its mark. Now, there's a sequel on the way, and my hopes are not high for it. Why? Well, allow me to go into detail for you. From all the rumors and pictures I've seen, I do believe this film is going to suffer from the same fate of Raimi's Spider-Man 3. Too much going on, aka overstuffing. From all the research I've done on this movie, there's going to be a lot going on. Let's look at the apparent villains. For starters, we got Jamie Foxx portraying the ultimate version of Electro. When I first heard Jamie was going to play Electro, one word came to mind. Huh? I'm not one of those people who complain about colorblind casting. The late Michael Clark Duncan was fantastic in Daredevil as the Kingpin, so that's not really a matter of concern. It's just that Jamie doesn't strike me as a villainous character. Granted, I haven't seen his whole portfolio of movies, but whenever I do see him, I see Ray Charles or the gunsling in Django, not some blue puffball with electric powers. He's a good actor, yes, but I just don't see him as the main villain. Plus, look at his alter ego. Max Dillon here looks as if Steve Urkel grew up. 
Dr. Connors already looked suspicious enough in the first film before he turned into the lizard. Can Mark Webb tone down on the creepy factor with these characters? Moving on, the supposed second villain of the movie is the Rhino. Now, I'm all for giving lesser known villains a bigger role in these movies, but come on! The Rhino? He's a pretty silly villain to begin with in the first place. And to put the cherry on top, guess who's playing him? Paul Giamatti! Now, I will give them the benefit of the doubt that Paul does seem like a good choice to play the villain, but the idea of the Rhino in a live-action film still percolates unnecessary comedy to me, especially after the dark tone of the first film. But I always did say for a good drama to work, you need comedy. Which leads me to the next section of characters being introduced, the Osborne family. We get Harry Osborne, played by Dane Behan, being introduced and he looks like some hipster poser. Then we got Chris Cooper, maniacal laugh, maniacal laugh, playing Norman Osborne, so there will be obvious hints at the Green Goblin throughout the film. But wait! There's more! We're being introduced to Mary Jane in this film as well. Do I smell a possible love triangle? Well, too bad, because this film will obviously without a doubt feature the death of Gwen Stacy. As pictured here, Gwen is wearing nearly the exact same outfit she wore in the comic book issue she died in. Sad, right? She only gets one and a half films to set up her character before biting it. But will the Green Goblin kill her? I doubt it because three villains in the movie worked so well in the past. I think you can all see where I'm coming from. This film right from the get-go feels so overstuffed, I cannot possibly see it achieving all of its goals without having a runtime nearing three hours. And let's face it, Spider-Man doesn't deserve to be a three hour long film. We got enough of that from Batman. The point of the matter is that these films need to drop what made the Dark Knight Trilogy the Dark Knight Trilogy. Let these new films breathe and be what they want to be. Spider-Man will always be a corny comic book character in my eyes. He did not need some dramatic edge all thanks to Mark Webb and his team of writers. They churned out a lame and boring character piece who claimed he was Spider-Man but he felt more like Andrew Garfield at Halloween. I'll no doubt see the new Spider-Man movie but my hopes won't be high. I only wish it gets something right, unlike the first film. I'm the Long Wannabe, and this has been a movie moment. Thanks for watching. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, just whatever a spider.